9,000 years ago, in the area corresponding to modern-day Pakistan, one of the oldest civilizations was born. It was the Indus Valley Civilization, also known as the Harappan Civilization. The Indus built water supply systems, two-story houses, and pools long before other nations learned to do it. That said, in their entire existence, they didn't once go to war. However, in 1300 BC, the entire Indus civilization suddenly disappeared, leaving behind nothing but rocks, fire damaged as if after a powerful explosion. And the area remains contaminated with radiation and scattered around the streets as if death came to them out of the blue. At the same time, the ancient Indian epics describe a flash as brilliant as a thousand suns that could destroy an entire civilization. It feels like someone destroyed the ancient Indus civilization with an atomic bomb. Could it really have perished in a nuclear war? Two hundred years ago, explorer Charles Masson visited the province of Punjab, modern-day Pakistan, where he discovered the remains of an ancient city. It turned out to be Harappa, one of the capital cities of the Indus civilization. The city dates back as far as the Bronze Age. It was founded in 2600 BC, but further excavation revealed that the first settlements existed there as early as in the 7th millennium BC. As for its territory, the civilization spread over the entire valley of the river Indus. With an area of around 1 million square kilometers, it compares to modern-day Bolivia. At its height, the Indus civilization had a population of almost 5 million people. This is more than the combined populations of its three contemporaries, namely Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, and ancient China. Almost a hundred years after the discovery of Harappa, an archaeological excavation revealed another large city, Mohenjo-Daro. Its name means Mound of the Dead Men. Around 35,000 people lived in the city, and by the standards of the second millennium BC, it was a city of the future. It was there that people invented toilets, and these were not hits in backyards, but full-blown rooms and houses connected to a drainage system. The city itself was divided into two parts. The lower part of Mohenjo-Daro was residential. The streets were all built according to the same scheme, north to south and east to west. And along the buildings, there were jugs for people to throw away trash, similar to our bins or garbage cans today. The upper part was the citadel. It had a grain silo, a trading quarter, baths, and an enormous public water tank. It was 12 meters long, 7 meters wide, and 3 meters deep. A layer of tar on its floor kept the tank water tight. A giant barrel with rainwater was placed nearby. Fresh water would be led into the tank through ducts, and dirty water would be drained out through the gutters in the drainage system. Due to this, the water in the tank was always fresh, and this was at a time when people didn't even know how to smelt iron. The Indus civilization also had its own writing system. Scientists have managed to recover ceramic tablets, also known as seals. These tablets depicted various animals, deities, and symbols which haven't been deciphered yet. The only thing that scientists have figured out is that the Indus wrote from right to left. But the meaning of the strange hieroglyphs and the purpose of the tablets still remains a mystery. And it's not the only puzzle that the Harappan civilization left behind. The thing is, Mohenjo-Daro was surrounded by a high wall. Historians assume that, in case of danger, the citizens could take shelter in the spacious citadel. But all those precautions were meant to protect the city not from enemy raids, but from floods. Moreover, the Indus civilization had absolutely no weapons or army. 
That said, the people weren't isolated and engaged in active trade with their neighbors, for example, with Mesopotamia. Around 2600 BC, Mesopotamian tablets started mentioning trade with a faraway land. Gold, silver, copper, and lapis lazuli were brought from that land to Mesopotamia. What's curious is that the Indus exported their goods by sea. This indicates that they had a commercial fleet, were prosperous, developed cities, and precious metal mines, but no army. How is it that this rich civilization didn't ever become a target for any invaders in its entire existence? Apparently, the Indus leaders mastered the art of diplomacy. After all, the modern world is not devoid of examples of conflicts that were resolved not by war. Say, in 1978, U.S. President Jimmy Carter managed to settle the conflict between Egypt and Israel. For 30 years, these two nations had fought four wars against each other. In the late 70s, when the peace talks reached a dead end, Carter invited the Israeli Prime Minister and the President of Egypt to a two-week-long meeting. After that, no more armed conflicts broke out between the countries. It's possible that the Indus civilization, which marched ahead of its time, boasted diplomats as good as Jimmy Carter. But even that didn't save it from the terrible catastrophe. In 1300 BC, the Indus Valley civilization simply vanished. All they left behind them were city ruins and mysterious tablets. But where could an entire civilization have disappeared to? Scientists aren't sure why the Indus just vanished suddenly. Some researchers tend to blame the Sarasvati River, which started to dry out. This brought about a drought, which forced the Indus to move to the plains of the River Ganges, where they mixed with other peoples over the years. According to another theory, the Indus Indus disappeared when they cut down all the forests in the area. They needed lumber to fire bricks, which they used to build cities. Eventually, forests were cleared and the area turned into a desert. Fields were plagued by the drought and the civilization left the Indus Valley. Another version is that the urban population perished in a cholera or malaria epidemic. But all of these theories have the same downside. Excavations didn't reveal anything that would corroborate them. In fact, the Sarasvati River might well turn out to be the stuff of legend. It was described in an epic, but no one knows whether it existed in real life. On the other hand, archaeologists did find something truly bizarre. Back in 1922, during an excavation in Mohenjo-Daro, scientists stumbled upon the remains of around 40 bodies in the lower city. Some of the skeletons were found lying in strange, unnatural poses, as if their deaths were sudden. But that wasn't all. In 1977, researcher David Davenport studied the excavation site and discovered a hollow 50 meters in diameter. All the rocks inside it seemed to have melted and turned into a glassy mass. But that could have only been caused by extremely high temperatures, no less than 1,500 degrees Celsius. One might think Mohenjo-Daro witnessed an explosion almost as powerful as a nuclear one. And this may turn out to be true. Archaeologists working in the state of Rajasthan in northwest India discovered a layer of radioactive dust. The find is just 700 kilometers away from Mohenjo-Daro. A radioactive cloud could well have traveled such a distance after a nuclear explosion. Besides, traces of radiation were also found in the city itself. Researchers measured the radiation background of some of the body remains and found out it was 50 times above normal. Normal. Moreover, the ancient Indian epic Mahabharata contains mentions of a powerful explosion with the brilliance of 10,000 suns that could burn entire nations. All signs point to a nuclear explosion in Mohenjo-Daro, which happened thousands of years before nuclear power plants and weapons. But how could that be possible? 
We might get closer to solving the mystery if we look into the Oklo uranium deposit in Gabon, Africa. In 1972, uranium processing plant workers in France noticed that the ore from the Oklo mine was slightly different. The thing is, all deposits on Earth store the same amount of uranium-235. The atoms of this isotope always make up 0.720 thousandths of a percent of the material's mass. And the samples mined in Oklo contain three thousandths of a percent less than that. This meant that the ore in this deposit was somehow stripped of around 200 kilograms of uranium. This amount is enough to make almost five nuclear bombs. But where could this uranium isotope have gone? Paul Kuroda, professor of chemistry at the University of Arkansas, calculated that two billion years ago, the proportion of uranium-235 in the deposit was as high as 3%. That was enough to turn the Oklo mine into a natural nuclear reactor. Kuroda assumed that such a reactor operated in cycles. When groundwater reached the deposit, it would turn on for half an hour. And when the water evaporated because the reactor heated up, the process stopped, resuming again after about two and a half hours. And these cycles went on for 500,000 years. During that time, about 10 tons of uranium-235 decayed in the Oklo natural reactor. Assuming that a reactor like that existed somewhere close to Mohenjo-Daro, it might have caused the nuclear explosion that destroyed the Indus civilization. But one thing doesn't add up. The Indus stories describe something more than just a powerful explosion. The Mahabharata speaks of a weapon that provoked the explosion. In addition, it gives every detail of the aftermath of using that weapon. Survivors lost their hair and nails, and the ground and food became infected. But what if the nuclear explosion in Mohenjo-Daro wasn't an accident? A thousand years after the Indus civilization disappeared, Ashoka, the ruler of the Maurya Empire, which emerged in its place, decided to create a secret society. Ashoka believed that some secret knowledge from the past could destroy his empire. Wanting to keep all knowledge away from the masses, he summoned the Nine Unknown Men. The Empire's nine wisest people were to write nine books that contained all breakthrough knowledge of the past and the present. Those nine books were on microbiology, cosmology, physiology, gravity, sociology, propaganda, light, communication, and alchemy. Incidentally, to say that the knowledge recorded in those books was ahead of its time would be an understatement. Some things described there are even more than modern scientists know. For instance, the physiology book describes the touch of death technique that teaches to kill with a single touch. Legend has it that the information leaked from this book formed the basis for the martial art of judo. The communication book suggests the nine unknown men knew that aliens existed. The book on light describes the use of light as a weapon. And China today even claims to be using anti-gravity laws from the gravity volume for research. But What's even more interesting is that the nine unknown men knew about radiation and could even exploit it in their interest. It was as early as in 1879 that French writer Louis Jacolio, in his book called Occult Science in India, theorized that one of the nine unknown men's books described a water sanitation technique based on exposure to radiation. The author believed the river Ganges was proof of it. After all, Jacolio claimed that despite all the sewage and other muck that ends up in it, the river remains clean. Modern day researchers confirm that too. Take, for example, Pradeep Bhargava, a hydrology professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. His reasoning is that while river water usually contains lots of microorganisms and bacteria that exhaust oxygen reserves, this is not the case with the Ganges. Professor Bhargava claims that the river has 25 times more oxygen than any other river in the world. It may suggest that something destroys microorganisms and disinfects the water. But modern-day science doesn't know what it is exactly. 
What if the nine unknown men actually possess knowledge about radiation and they store the information from the books for centuries too? If so, it's not at all surprising that at the time of the end of civilization, people could use radioactive decay and radiation for their benefit. And it's possible that the Indus used that knowledge not only for water sanitation. If the Indus civilization had the first prototypes of nuclear weapons, that would explain many historical inconsistencies, like the absence of an army or defensive structures in Mohenjo-Daro. After all, why build defensive walls and feed hundreds of soldiers if you have a weapon that can obliterate your enemy's entire army? Okay, but how come a post-explosion crater was discovered in one of the main cities of the Indus civilization? Could it be that nuclear weapons were in the arsenals of the Indus enemies too? In fact, the inventions of ancient Indian civilizations were so incredible that nuclear weapons don't seem that impossible by comparison. For example, the local epic gives a comprehensive description of flying machines that could even be used for space travel. Those were called vimanas. The first mentions of flying chariots were really early and can be found in the Ramayana, an ancient Indian epic written between 800 and 300 BC. Vimana is a pyramid like aircraft with a round base. Its interior is divided into several levels with portholes in its walls and a dome above. The ancient Indian epic says Vimanas flew as fast as the wind and emitted a melodious sound. There were actually several types of Vimanas which differed in shape and interior. Some Indian temples look like these flying objects from the outside. Maybe people saw those chariots in the sky and reflected them in their buildings buildings on the ground. After all, according to local beliefs, Vimanas were used by the gods themselves. And still, Professor Dilip Kumar Kanjalal from the Calcutta Sanskrit College, who specializes in ancient languages, believes that Vimanas may have existed in real life. He says they were powered by mercury vortex engines. You see, when mercury heats up, it gravitates away from the heat source. This allows the turbine to rotate, and the energy generated as a result can be used to fly. The Mahabharata, written between 400 BC and 400 AD, describes a Vimana set in motion by lightning. The chariot could not only fly, but also reach the upper layers of the atmosphere and even space. Legends tell of gods flying out there to fight demons. One of those battles even happened on the moon. It's described in great detail in the Ramayana, and according to the epic, it was a Vimana that the gods used to reach the moon. And although it's just a legend, strange, out-of-place artifacts are indeed found on the moon from time to time. For example, when in 1971 Apollo 14 delivered lunar rock samples, scientists found a piece that had found its way to the moon from Earth. According to David Kring, a lunar geologist from the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, that rock formed on our planet around four and a half billion years ago. But how did it end up on the moon? Scientists cannot give a definitive answer to this question. The common belief is that a piece of rock was knocked out by a meteorite impact around 150 million years after Earth was formed. Since the moon used to be three times closer to us back then than it is now, pieces of rocks from Earth ended up on its surface. But then this rock would have had to remain intact on the moon for billions of years. Perhaps a fragment could have landed there with the Vimana. But if you still doubt that Vimanas could actually exist and fly into space, take a look at the Dragon spacecraft. SpaceX designed this spacecraft to deliver people and cargo to Earth's orbit. Its shape is very similar to the shape of the heavenly chariot from ancient Indian legends. But according to the epic, Vimanas were used not only for air and space travel. Some of them could be turned into weapons, dropping single projectiles from the sky on enemy cities. Legends describe them as charged with all the power of the universe, leaving behind poles of smoke and fire as bright as thousands of suns. One such projectile was powerful enough to destroy an entire entire civilization. Vimanas that fly into space and drop nuclear bombs on enemy cities. I mean, 
This may sound too incredible, but all this was described in the ancient Indian epics. And that means even thousands of years ago, humans were contemplating flights to the moon and the possibilities of using nuclear energy for both peaceful and non-peaceful purposes. So do you still think our ancestors believed the sky was a solid dome? 